Okay. So um, today we're going to uh, build on some of the material that you would have covered within um, the videos, which I asked you to, uh, to scan, uh, to understand some elements of representation of, on the one hand, uh, heterogeneity uh, in agents, and on the other hand, uh, the characterization of agent dynamics using uh, a common higher level abstraction, namely state charts. Um, and uh, today's material will, will draw on both those elements, but from, from more of a conceptual uh, standpoint. What I wanted you to, uh, to secure from the, uh, from the videos was um, at once uh, some practical exposure as to how you introduce differences between stages um, into an agent-based modeling using one package, uh, any logic, um, and uh, how one introduces elements of agent behavior using this construct of state charts. Um, but I also hoped that uh, in so doing, um, you might uh, reflect on um, some of the more general principles extending from that material. Um, for example, the fact that within agent-based models, we can characterize differences uh, in the static properties of agents characterized using, using uh, parameters within any logic that are, uh, that are both discrete. They take on a, a defined set of distinct values. Um, and at, alternatively, uh, continuous um, values that can take on uh, a, a, a spectrum of possible values, uh, such as we use when approximating real numbers with things like doubles uh, uh, within our, our computing. These are conceptually continuous quantities. Um, conceptually speaking, they're not broken up into you know, just a, a very small number of, of possible values. Rather, such values can take on a wide range of, of possible uh, uh, particular uh, quantitations. And uh, agent-based models can represent either of these. Um, and as we'll see, that's a bit different than for aggregate system dynamics models. If there was something that seemed jarring about it, um, it's with good reason. Uh, Secondly, um, I wanted you to see these constructs of, of state charts. And uh, state charts uh, are likely to have reminded you of stocks and flows at a certain level. And um, indeed, there's uh, many similarities uh, between those two mechanisms. Um, uh, both characterize sets of possible states. Uh, that could be occupied on the one hand by an agent, on the other hand by the whole population. They characterize possible routes of change between those states. Uh, in stock and flow models, these are the verbs, these are the flows. In, um, uh, in the context of state charts, these are the transitions uh, which go between states. Um, and they also characterize further the rules under which those actions take place, the, the things that govern the conditions under which an agent would, uh, would transition or how many agents transition or what's their probability per unit time of transitioning. So if the two reminded you of each other, it's, it's with good reason. And, and both are very uh, powerful ways of characterizing dynamics at one fell swoop, characterizing the states, the actions that change uh, those states and the rules that, that, that govern those, uh, the firing of those actions. Um, but as we'll see, there's, there's twists here as well. Um, we, we have an added degree of uh, flexibility, um, of versatility as it were with, with age-based models. Um, that really runs into challenges, becomes very awkward, and ultimately becomes infeasible with, with uh, aggregate system dynamics models. Um, and specifically, it has to do with the interaction between multiple 
types of change to state, multiple processes. And uh, that was probably not borne out in your minds in the video, but it's something we'll be exploring here today. So we're gonna build on those impressions from the video, um, impressions that will be valuable when pursuing problem set three, which I'm going to be releasing uh, within days here. Um, but uh, it will allow you to deliver on the practical skills needed to, um, to answer questions there. But at the same time, should remind you of some conceptual matters. So today we're going to be looking at um, a really marked difference between on the one hand aggregate system dynamics models and on the other agent based models. Um, while not minimizing the commonalities between these mechanisms, after all, both share more than, they, than the ways in which they differ. Um, they're both dynamic modeling mechanisms depicting state changing over time where those changes are dictated by that state. But there's some marked differences in how they handle this issue of, of um, heterogeneity in the population, uh, differences between different, um, different agents in the population here, different members of the population, and how they, they characterize uh, evolution when it comes uh, to change along that, that occurs with respect to multiple different types of processes, multiple concerns, um, perhaps uh, two different types of infections, uh, HIV on the one hand and hepatitis C on the other, uh, or COVID-19 and influenza on the other. Uh, maybe it's issues having to do with uh, behavior and, and uh, uh, developments of an infection. So someone's progression with respect to COVID-19 um, uh, might and, and likelihood of, of progressing in different ways might depend on whether they're, they've proceeded along a vaccination process which by which they are conferred one dose and then another and in the fullness of time, uh, booster doses. Um, so often we have these multiple processes which apply to a given agent uh, sometimes in common spheres like health, sometimes in different spheres, uh, uh, such as uh, health and, and aspects of behavior and aspects of, of, of social services, et cetera. And they proceed along different dimensions as it were. And when it comes to characterizing that within agent-based modeling, we have much more flexibility of repertoire, much more uh, versatility and much more indeed scalability than we have at the level of, of uh, aggregate system dynamics models. This presentation is one that should draw also on some of your exposure as computer scientists to issues having to do with performance. And uh, I haven't kept up with the latest division of materials through uh, between say uh, uh, aspects of what's covered in 280 compared to uh, in some of the, uh, the higher level courses involving um, algorithms, um, 360, for example, or, or uh, machines um, and hierarchies and language hierarchies um, that's covered in fourth year. And so I'm not sure what everyone has, has seen, but we'll be looking at some aspects of scaling today. And, and we'll see something striking there about the differences between these two types of models. Um, on the one hand, and I'm going to give you a bit of a spoiler here. On the one hand, uh, we have system dynamics modeling where there's no change as, uh, to model performance or model memory footprint as we increase the size of the population. The numbers that are circulating, the count of people who are susceptible versus infected versus recovered, it's just larger, it's a larger number, but it doesn't occupy more time to run. It's not like computing with the larger numbers forces us to carry a heavier load. That's not the nature of modern processors, nor does it occupy more memory. After all, representing a double that zero takes no less memory 
than representing one that, that uh, carries a, a population of 1.2 million of our fair province. Um, but so, so system dynamics model has no, has no encumbrances that extend from enlarging the population. It, it's really unaffected by that essentially. But in agent-based modeling, oh boy, doubling the population size in agent-based model at least doubles the model runtime. Can do more, can do more due to, if you have dense networks or if you have uh, memory hierarchy effects, which come in, you know, it may slow down by, if you double the population size by, by more than a factor of two runtime increase. But it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's at least double. Um, for, for current implementations of, of agent-based models. We'll get into some more, more, more advanced uh, issues later in the course involving parallelization opportunities and taking advantage of locality of dependence between agents that may allow for parallelizing different aspects of the same model. But we'll put that aside at the moment. What's very clear though is System dynamics model, you double population size, it doesn't make a whit of difference in either the memory or the runtime. Agent-based modeling, it does on both. And typically you're gonna double memory size as well. So uh, that's a big difference, but at the same time, we'll see that there's, uh, there's, there's issues under which agent-based models compare very favorably to system dynamics models that lie at the heart of today's lecture. And specifically, they have to do with scaling with respect to capturing differences between individuals and the population, differences and characteristics that are static, heterogeneity, capturing a population distinguished by by wanting to keep track of people's income and education level and province of birth and current province of residence and age and, and all these good things. Um, or with respect to processes that play out over time. And in some models, age is one of those, it, it ages. We do, you may not be aware of it, age with time, I can assure you that. Um, but um, beyond that, um, we often have other, other processes which change over time. Um, that I, that I had enumerated, some of which I enumerated earlier. And when it comes to characterizing multiple such processes or multiple dimensions of heterogeneity, aggregate system dynamics models start to creak and groan. And there's limits, strict uh, or limits that become increasingly onerous as you successively try to incorporate more aspects of ways people can change, more types of processes or more types of distinctions between people, heterogeneity. Um, and it blows up combinatorially. Um, meanwhile, in agent-based modeling, uh, the impacts of adding heterogeneity or adding additional processes that change state are modest. They're additive in nature, whereas they're multiplicative in nature over in the, uh, in the aggregate uh, system dynamics world. Essentially, you double the size of the model, the runtime of the model, if you want to distinguish, for example, between uh, uh, people who are born male versus female. Um, it, it, it doubles the number of compartments you need to characterize the memory and the runtime. Uh, whereas this makes very little difference in a system dynamics model, or excuse me, in an agent-based model. Okay, so that's a bit of a about of a sneak preview of where we're going. And if you if you uh, secure the essential understanding from my utterances here over the past uh, ten or so minutes, you will have done well. Uh, I will be going into some fairly um, fairly uh, quickly covered but substantive mathematics, um, and uh, I don't expect necessarily you to pick up on all elements of it immediately. But I would like you to, um, to be able to at least understand those broad principles I just articulated. And as necessary, reflect that understanding in pop quizzes and in uh, the final exam. Okay, so let's, let's dive 
if we may, into uh, the, the specifics of the, uh, the slides here. And I have to apologize. I didn't get a chance to post these uh, beforehand. Um, I always try to do so, but uh, because of these um, uh, computational distress uh, caused by um, uh, bizarre versioning problems with uh, Google Slides, I didn't didn't have an uh, a chance of doing that, and uh, I'll get them posted forthwith. Um, okay, so uh, our query for today is talking about heterogeneity and state representation, and uh, chastened by our experience last time, I will now share my screen um, so that you are um, uh, spared the uh, further indignity of my, uh, my appearance. Um, Okay, um, so I, I trust that uh, you can see my screen now. Um, and uh, I'm surprised I don't hear cries of relief. Okay, um, so you'll recall that within our, actually our opening presentation on agent-based modeling, I made a distinction um, between aggregate stock and flow models and agent-based models in a couple of ways. and. I, I noted that in aggregate system dynamics models, we subdivide a model up according to characteristics of, of individuals in the population. And, and then each stock, say the stock of infectives or the stock of recovered, characterizes the count of individuals who fall within that category. They're infective or they're recovered, right? Um, uh, and, uh, this, this was something which holds both for cases where they proceed between those stocks or for characteristics they're more or less fixed. For example, um, someone's, uh, uh, someone's uh, uh, status with respect to whether they were born in Canada or not. Um, dichotomists, were they born in Canada or not? And if we wanted a model which had different dynamics associated with it, um, which depended on whether someone's an immigrant or not, we would need a, a separate copy of a stock for susceptible immigrants versus susceptible non-immigrants. For example, infective immigrants, infective non-immigrants. By contrast, in age-based modeling, we have this characterization of a population, and I've shown members of the population with the indignity of, of representation as circles here, where each of those circles should be understood as an agent who evolves, evolves according to similar logic, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, exposed again are people who are infected, but not infective. Um, by contrast, within system dynamics, we captured those in different uh, stocks, right? Here we're capturing them in different states of a state chart. But each individual here is characterizing their own state. We don't have some master count of the number of people who fall in each of these categories that's maintained for the whole population. Rather, each, each person maintains where they are in this uh, state chart, right? Um, and uh, they're also responsible for keeping track of their other characteristics, such as whether they were an immigrant or not. Um, and so, you know, in, in, if we were to summarize that again in a bit more of a, a condensed way, within a system dynamics model, each stock counts the number of individuals with a specific combination of characteristics, like their state with respect to COVID-19 and whether they're an immigrant or not. Uh, by contrast, in an age-based model, each individual maintains information on their specific characteristics, whether it's static or dynamic. Okay, um, you should hopefully have internalize that much through watching those videos and reflecting on your understanding from aggregate system dynamics models. And there's a big difference between the two. Uh, they are at once similar. After all, there's kind of an isomorphic structure here between the states in, this, uh, in the stock and flow and these states as characterized within an individual. Uh, but there are different levels of, of aggregation and have different types of organization. Now let's, uh, to, to prepare us for the onslaught of the mathematics that lies before us, um, 
let's just uh, reflect on this a little bit more. I'm trying to do the spiral walk through uh, before we, you know, hit the really uh, a bit more gnarly uh, reasoning here. So in a population, put aside whether it's an age-based model, you know, we have some population. Uh, and each person in the population will call a sample of the population. It's a, it, it, here we're, we're focused on single individuals. And each individual in that population might have certain specific characteristics, uh, which we've characterized along three dimensions. Uh, perhaps their ethnicity, uh, th their current sex, and their income. Um, and uh, each individual has some particular values, some particular vector of values across these characteristics. Um, now, now, that's all why, uh, fine and good. Um, but uh, I'd like you to reflect on the fact that uh, we could construct for this same population a summary, as it were, of the of this population, which is shown up here uh, in this uh, in this characterization of a cube. Okay, uh, so on the one on the one dimension, uh, we have people's sex. Uh, on another dimension, we have categories. That'll be important. Categories of income. Not particular values, but but categories of income, and on the other something about ethnicity, um, and I say that this is a summary because each element of this cube contains not individuals but a count of the number of people that fall into that category. Right? This would be whoa some sort of summary of this population here uh, by counts. It, counts the number of people who are divided up, you know, who, who are characterized by particular combinations of properties, right? Um, and uh, if we wanted to know the value of any such cell, we, we could memoize it and sort of keep track of it in this cube, this data cube. And indeed in data warehousing, that's what we do. Um, we roll it up into a cube um, for, for analytics purposes. But uh, we could alt alternatively uh, just as well go through the population and count the number of people who fall within a certain characteristic. So if we want to know the number of people who fall within this kind of facet of the cube here that's closest to you and me uh, by appearance, uh, that would be the number that are female, over earn over $50,000 a year, and are African-American. And we could go through and count count that number, right? Um, so here we have samples shown in this kind of depiction of the population, particular people whose characteristics we keep track of. Uh, by contrast, we could alternatively have a summary measure um, that, that reflects totals over those samples. So I'd like to reflect on, on this a little bit to lend some understanding to uh, the difference between agent-based modeling and aggregate system dynamics modeling, okay? So consider where we have a total of N samples, capital N. And suppose we have D attributes, okay? Now D here is three because it's, we have ethnicity, we have sex, and we have income, okay? Um, and each of those attributes carries possible values. Um, uh, and, and I denote the number of possible values for attribute I with C sub I, okay? So, so we have some number of possibilities for sex. Let's say here we have three, male, female, other. Um, we have some number of possibilities for ethnicity. Maybe it's five, uh, common in the example from the states which inspired this. And maybe we have some number of possible values or possible categories for income. Maybe it's three as well. So, um, each of those is value of C sub I for different I. Uh, uh, so that's for each of those attributes. The attribute is something like ethnicity, and we have some number of possibilities for that ethnicity. Well, if you think about it, each of the samples uh, can take on, if we ask how many distinct vectors of attributes are there, 
it can take on, well, look, uh, we could have any possible ethnicity and any possible sex and any possible income. So the number of possibilities is the number of possibilities of ethnicity times the number of possibilities of sex. After all, we could have any combination of them and we have any, any of the income categories. So it's just the multiplication. That's what that capital pi is. It, it's multiplying. You may have seen in, in some classes like 260, a sigma where you're adding up. Here we're multiplying. So this is basically shorthand for if, if D were three, as it is here, we have three characteristics. Um, we're just multiplying C1 times C2 times C3, where again, each of the Cs counts the number of possibilities for each of these attributes. The number of possible ethnicities times the number of sex, possible sexes times the number of possible incomes. That's the number of kind of distinct possible values a population member could have, right? So if all of these were dichotomous, all of them were binary, you know, the A or B across all three characteristics, each possible person could be encoded as a string of three bits, right? Um, one or zero indicating for each successive bit whether they had value A or B for each of these. I'm just giving an example uh, where each of these were dichotomous, but in general they're not, and so we multiply these. Um, okay, um, so look, uh, if we think about the amount of computational resources required to, um, to maintain this, um, we could actually compare sort of how much, how much space it requires, how many bits are required to, to maintain the summary compared to required to, to kind of represent this population as a bunch of samples. And um, the, the kicker here is that um, each of these samples, there's a lot of samples, maybe N is really large, maybe it's a million, right? Um, and you might be excused for thinking, well, look, I mean, this is a summary of the upper right. This is the whole population. It's got to be the summary is, 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 is smaller. It, it can be stored more, more compactly than, than storing the attributes of each person in the population. But it's not so simple, actually, because this is, again, the kicker is the number of different combinations. So this cube on the upper right is to deal with all possible combinations of values, right? All, so it, is to, it has to have one of these facets, one of these kind of little cube, cuboids within it um, for each possible combination of ethnicity, sex, and income. And there may be a, a lot of those, a lot of those possible combinations. After all, it goes up as the product of the distinct values. Um, but meanwhile, characterizing each possible person in the population uh, doesn't actually require that much space. Each, each person uh, uh, requires enough to, to store their, their ethnicity, their sex, and their income. And how, much, how many bits are required to store that is, is gonna, it's going to depend on um, you know, the number of possibilities. But if we have, for example, uh, four possible ethnicities, we only need two bits to represent ethnicity for each person, right? Um, just two bits. It can take on one of four values. Um, so it could be zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. Um, and each of those would encode an ethnicity. Um, and then we, we'd have to have for sex. And if, if that were dichotomous, one or zero, it'd be one bit. And, and, and then if we had, say, three income categories, we can encode that with two bits and have one to one illegal value, right? Um, so if you kind of total up the amount of storage required uh, for each of these, oh man, I'm, okay, NI is, should be CI. I, um, I switched partway through to, to lower confusion. And now I've added to the confusion. So NI is, is CI, sorry, I, um, I, I goofed there. These should be log base two of, of CI. So if, if we have, you know, four choices. So CI for a given attribute is four. 
then we need two bits. Um, and we just go through and we sum up the bits required for each attribute, each of the D attributes. Um, that's okay. So, so storing each person's values here is, is not that expensive. And, but we have N of them we have to store up, right? We have to add them all up. Um, each person requires this many bits naively, and, and we just multiply that times n to get the total storage and bits required for this whole population. Um, by contrast, if we represent this cube, we need a number of facets that's equal to this product of the CIs. And if n isn't that large, this cube is going to be very sparse, right? It's going to have lots of zeros in it where nobody falls. Let's suppose we only have 100 people in this whole lumen population, right? Um, there might be quite a few of these facets of the cube, quite a few little cuboids within it where we have zero people and somewhere we have a couple. Um, if n were two, we'd only have at most two of these cuboids occupied, right? And the rest would be zero. Um, so as the number of possible attributes goes up as you're keeping track not only of ethnicity and sex and income, but education level and height and weight and province of birth and province where they currently live, et cetera, you're going to get a cube which is growing geometrically. It's, it's, it's got a number of cuboids within it and a number of possible voxels or sort of bits of space within it that goes up as the product of all these things. It's, it's, and so each time, if we want to keep track, let's suppose of someone's um, uh, someone's you know current status. For example, do they have a driver's license or not? That's uh, maybe that's dichotomous. It's binary, you know, true or false. Do they have it or not? We double the size, the number of things we have to keep track of in the cube. Um, so there are times where we actually require more memory to store this cube than we do to store each member of the population. And I give it a little example here uh, for this where we have attributes and we have six of them here and they each can take on a number of possibilities C sub I as given by in these parentheses. Um, and I total up the number of elements, the number of facets, the number of cuboids, the number of voxels, whatever you wanna call these little Cube, cube things that form you know, within the, the, the cube as a whole. And if we multiply those out, we get some you know, horrendously large number. Um, uh, and if we need to store an integer for each of these, uh, we actually occupy a fair amount of memory. But meanwhile, if we had, if we just store for you know, each of these people, this information, all it requires is 18 bits per person. And, and it, so look, uh, done naively, even if we just allocate, gosh, just, you know, allocate a separate integer for each of these, what the heck? Don't, don't try to mash them down to one or two bits, just separate integer. Uh, we got 24 bytes per sample. And gosh, we can store a lot of people for, for, for this many uh, bytes, right? Um, so uh, we could store 23,000 people for the same amount of space it requires to, 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 require, to keep track of this cube. So what we're dealing with here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't need you to get, like don't get all tied up in the mathematics of this. I'm trying to communicate a few points. None of that is gonna be on the final exam. I can guarantee you that. But what I'm trying to get at is something that's called the curse of dimensionality. And that, could be on the final exam, okay? Uh, the curse of dimensionality is basically telling us there's a combinatorial blow up, a infeasible explosion of possibilities as we, possibilities of, of things we have to keep track of as the number of dimensions of heterogeneity rise. As we go from just keeping track of someone's you know whether uh, whether or not they um, uh, they were born in Canada, to that in their sex or that in their sex in their income category or that in their sex in their income category ethnicity. As we're doing that, we're we're multiplying geometrically. Geometrically, we're 
we're adding, we're, we're multiplying the number of things we have to keep track of. Um, and the number of things grows very rapidly. You know, you, you do another, each time you add a new dimension, a new attribute of heterogeneity, a new type of thing we have to worry about uh, to keep track of, we're multiplying by a term here. That's the curse of dimensionality. And that, that leads this number to get really, really large. By contrast, if these were pluses, it would be small potatoes. But this is multiplication. And even you know, adding in a dichotomous one, a binary one, will double this uh, and double the memory. And as we'll see for system dynamics models, double the runtime as well. By contrast, if we do that over here in the area of samples, we're, we're just adding a little bit more information each person has to keep track of, each, each sample has to keep track of each agent for agent-based modeling. We're not adding that much. We're just you know, appending in a little bit more, like appending in, done crudely, four more bytes for one of these uh, one of these attributes, or maybe it's just two bits if we're clever about it and it has four possible values. So, you know, storing things as samples uh, versus storing them in a summary, you, you while you could be excused for thinking a summary is always cheaper, um, there's a, it's the summary suffers this curse of dimensionality that is not suffered by the samples themselves. The samples themselves, um, at, you know, don't grow markedly as you add in new dimensions of heterogeneity. And it actually becomes advantageous as you add more attributes to, to store it in a sample form, to use agents as compared to trying to subdivide an aggregate system dynamics model. That's where we're headed. So this is to build some intuition. And what, it, what I want you to get out of here is that summaries, including aggregate system dynamics models, suffer from the curse of dimensionality when it comes to distinct capturing distinctions in the population, um, whether it's static distinctions like heterogeneity, like things that don't change, or whether it's distinctions of state. So if you can get that and, and internalize that, you'll be doing well. Okay, um, okay. so I, I'd like to talk about this um, this scaling with heterogeneity. And you know, I've just shown some examples there. Um, but look, uh, I want to remind you that in system dynamics models, we capture distinctions between people um, that don't change over time, heterogeneity, uh, such as between men and women, let's say, uh, by separating things into different stocks. So, so uh, you know, if we uh, wanted to keep track uh, because of the different uh, levels of risk involved for COVID-19 hospitalization and, uh, and indeed associated with COVID-19 presentation for care or getting tested between men and women. Um, and there are some notable differences, including down to level of, of mortality. Um, we would need to have susceptibles, exposed, infectives, and recovered kept track, not for the whole population, but separately for men and women. So we'd have a susceptible men and, and we'd have a susceptible women. And we have exposed men and exposed women and in, infected men and infected women and recovered men and recovered women. And, and yes, uh, they would not be solitudes. Um, uh, susceptible women will become sus exposed women, become infected women, and become recovered women, and, and similarly for men, mutatis mutandis, but they would be mixing between them, right? A man could, could catch COVID-19 from a woman and, and vice versa, as well as from within their sex. But the key point is we'd have to double the size of this model, right? We'd have susceptible men, susceptible women, exposed men, exposed women, infected men, infected women, et cetera. We'd be doubling the size of the model, right? Uh, we'd we, as we say, we stratify it, okay, um, and and so we keep we keep track of that distinction by keeping track of different counts for each of those categories, each of those different values of the attribute. Um, now, this has some implications, um, and one of them that should be evident is that. You can only do it for distinctions that are discrete in character. Like you're not gonna 
create a separate value of this for all possible, you know, ages um, as a continuous quantity, you know, in terms of precisely how many seconds has it been since you were born, um, you're not going to be doing that. You might do it for broad categories or something like income, but not for the specific value of their income down to the cent um, uh, of their annual income. No, you're not going to be doing that. You're going to be doing it for broad categories. So men and women, sure, but uh, maybe low income, medium income, high income. Um, but it's not feasible to do for continue, truly continuous values. Um, uh, if, we, if we keep track of either, there's a, there's a cursor dimensionality here, even to keep track of a single dichotomous, a binary aspect of heterogeneity, you know, male, female, we have to basically double the size of them all, right? Uh, we, we double it. We, we have to keep track of it separately for men. And for women, and every stock gets copied. Um, so that's that's doubling the size of the model and doubling the memory it requires, doubling the amount of computation time it requires. We have to integrate twice as many different equations behind the scenes. Um, and in general, if we have d different dimensions of uh, of heterogeneity, each having n sub i choices. I'll go through and relabel this C sub I. We, we get, you know, the, the size of the model is increased by this factor. This is the same factor we saw here. It's, it's just C sub I and N sub I are the same. It's, I, I was not, not, not careful enough and, and uh, I will correct it, apologies. Um, but basically it explodes by this factor. Um, each time we have to just keep track of a new type of attribute we have to multiply the size of the model by that successively. Double, 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 multiplied by three, multiplied by 10. We want to keep track of set things separately for each province multiplied by 13. Um, province territory, excuse me, province would be 10, right? Um, so here we get this, this blow up combinatorial. We have the cursive dimensionality rears its ugly head um, for aggregate system dynamics models. We saw it earlier, the curse just kind of keeping track of attributes of a population. But now we're talking about models where things are changing over time. And, and we get that same curse. Uh, it's just the model size is blown up. The amount of model memory required is blown up by, according to the curse of dimensionality, multiplicatively. And so is the model runtime. Um, so, you know, if we want to run this, for example, for low income, high income, we'll get two different outputs for each. They, there's mixing between them. They're not solitudes. They're not running and, you know, passing like ships in the night. They're, they're actually influencing one another, but they need to be kept track of separately. Okay. And this is the cursive dimensionality associated with heterogeneity in aggregate stock and flow models. Um, let's talk about dimensions of state. And um, some of you will recall back to my opening remarks, uh, not 30 minutes then, when I, um, I commented to you that in many cases there are, um, if we think about say people in a population, there's multiple attributes or multiple processes which are applying to the population. And for COVID-19, I give the example of, you know, a person could have different COVID-19 status, but separately there's, there's the question of what's their, what's their vaccination level, right? You know, are they unvaccinated? Do they have one dose that's delivered of, of Moderna? Do they have two doses of Moderna um, delivered? Have they gotten a booster shot, et cetera? Um, and, and there's many other attributes too. You know, people have a lot of things going on. Um, uh, the marital status can change. They're aging. They have different levels of uh, educational achievement, um, et cetera. Um, they have other conditions that might, for COVID-19, uh, raise the risk. Things like diabetes or, or heart disease um, raise the risk, uh, and particularly lung disease could raise the risk they'll need, um, need hospitalization, for example. Um, 
So often within a given population, we have many types of processes which take place, which are themselves not independent typically, but which uh, need to proceed in parallel as it were. Um, and here within an aggregate system dynamics model, we have the same curse of dimensionality. If we think a lot of, along each process and how it might proceed uh, with the number of possible states along that you know, process I being N sub I, um, we have this combination, we have to keep track of this combination of states. So you could think of it here, and I, I wanted to draw this before class, but I ran plumb out of time. Um, imagine that you had susceptibles here, uh, susceptible exposed, effective recovered. Maybe you want to keep track as well over the multi-year time frame, or indeed the multi-decade time frame, which will likely confront us with COVID-19. Um, maybe you want to capture aging. So you have susceptibles in the youngest age category who can age into susceptibles in the, you know, so maybe it's a zero through four years old, the next is five through nine years old, the next is 10 through 14, 15 through 19, and, and they proceed upwards. But you need that as well that proceeding upward from susceptible, those are all susceptibles just at different ages. You need it for exposed as well and infectives and recovered. And there'd be kind of a lattice structure here where you would have going across infection progression within an age group and going up aging to successive age groups, right? Um, this is very common within these sort of models. Or if you want to keep track of people's uh, smoking status, smoking is known as a significant risk for COVID-19 and you want to capture people's, you know, smoking behavior, uh, you could represent that off of say susceptible non-smokers, susceptible current smokers, susceptible former smokers and show that progression. It's less compelling here because the time frames are quite different. But um, the point is when it comes to these models in order to capture multiple types of process, within an aggregate stock and flow model, you're really hampered by this combinatorial explosion. You've got to represent all possible combinations of state. They could be in any state with respect to COVID-19 and any state with respect to influenza at the same time. Um, and they could be progressing along one or the other. And so you've got to represent all combinations of them in this kind of lattice. This, and that, that's what gets you in this kind of multiplication here. You've got to consider they could be susceptible for COVID-19 and susceptible for influenza, or they could be susceptible for COVID-19 and currently infected, but not yet infective for influenza, or susceptible for COVID-19 and infective for influenza, and you know, all possible combinations. And you need a stock for each of them. And it blows up just as surely as this blows up, it blows up. You're trying to keep track of a summary across a population of how many people have a certain combination of characteristics. And whether it's static characteristics like heterogeneity or changing characteristics like as in uh, processes that are playing out, there's this combinatorial explosion. Okay, um, so here, um, I'm hoping I've communicated to you that an aggregate system dynamics models were hurting when it comes to representing heterogeneity and multiple types of processes. We can do it. We can grin and bear it to a point, you know, put in two, three, four types of heterogeneity by subscripting, instead of being susceptible sub I, we have susceptible sub I, J, K, L. Um, and we work with models like that sometimes. They're rather unpleasant, they're rather unwieldy and rather awkward, um, but you can do it. Uh, you just get into this multi-dimensional maze of this lattice, which applies at all these different levels. Uh, but at some point it becomes infeasible. Um, uh, we have to duplicate so many stocks uh, that the, the space, the running time, but more, more substantively, the clarity 
of the modeling is really impaired, um, especially if there's interactions between progression along diabetes, along with COVID-19 or COVID-19 and influenza, you start to have very awkward structures. There's a, there's a curse of dimensionality that applies here. Um, and this leads to more work for the modeler, reduced transparency, the model, larger memory footprint and slower models, all of them. And it's painful. Um, adding a new type of heterogeneity, critically from a software engineering standpoint, requires model-wide changes. So if we wanted to take this, we want to say, let's keep track of people's province of birth. What do we have to change? Um, or current province, what do we have to change? Well, we have to, every single stock across the entire model, every single flow across the model, and many of these intermediate categories, we have to duplicate. And so we have this global change that's caused by this one stinking need to consider this additional attribute. We have to, we have to change across the whole Bloomin model. We have to, we have to, uh, you know, have this global uh, re reworking of the model. That's painful, and it leads to errors, and it's time consuming, and and um, it's it's not good with a capital N, and I would note a capital G. Um, so, uh, you know, that's uh, something which often really bogs down modeling when you have a lot of heterogeneity for, for aggregate system dynamics models. And separately, um, you, you often have a desire to represent things that are conceptually continuous. Someone's birth weight, someone's height, someone's weight, you know, um, their age, but instead, you are shoehorned into keeping track of it as discrete values that are often quite coarse, quite coarse. Um, so we divide it up into income age categories, three of them, um, whereas we'd like to keep track of their, their you know, income to a much finer grained level uh, or their age to a much finer grained level. And you know, there's ways to work around it. So you have different age categories for kids different sized age categories for kids. So kids, maybe you have, you know, first month, second month, third month, uh, uh, up to the sixth month, and then you have half year increments. And then once they got to, you know, age five, you have one year increments and then up to age 10, and then you have five year increments. And by age 20, you have 10 year increments. Yeah, it gets, aging gets faster, it's true. Um, but uh, it gets quite awkward. Um, so, Aggregate system dynamics creaks and groans under the need to represent differences in the population. You can do it, but it's painful beyond uh, some extreme little basics like a dichotomous distinction. Okay, now let's talk about agent-based modeling. Um, the good news here is that, look, agent-based models can readily and very scalably result of uh, represent diverse agent characteristics. This is one of their fortes. Now that should be a factoid to remember. Moreover, it's not just we can scalably represent them in a nice way, and, and that's true, but we can represent a greater variety of these types of differences than we can with with system dynamics, aggregate system dynamics models. We can represent continuous, conceptually continuous um, uh, quantities. Now, it, it, would be, um, it would be pointless to get into the issue of, well, are they truly continuous on a digital computer? I mean, look, for all ascension purposes, um, it's a double precision value is, uh, is, is going to be viewed as continuous for most of these models. And we can readily capture, you know, extraordinarily fine-grained uh, attributes, things like income, birth weight, uh, height, geographic location, and latitude and longitude to many decimal points, um, uh, just as easily as we could discrete values, like whether they were an immigrant or not, or their country of origin, or their sex of birth, or whatever. Um, so um, here, uh, discrete quantities 
are not privileged as they are in system dynamics. In system dynamics aggregate models, you're dealing with discrete quantities. You're dealing with dividing the model up into discrete, uh, uh, discrete categories, sometimes ordinal, sometimes one is bigger than the other, but, but they, are, um, uh, they need to be defined into a typically quite small number of possible values. By contrast, in agent-based modeling, that's not the case. Moreover, in agent-based modeling, we have this other characteristic, which is extraordinarily powerful, and which we'll be getting to this Thursday in two days, which are relational attributes. There's a lot of attributes in the world that are not about you know, an, an agent by themselves. It's an agent's relationship to something else, often to another agent. Maybe it has to do with um, a relationship between child and mother, where it needs to keep track of who its mother is in the model. Maybe it's between a person and who their associated family unit is, or where their home is, or where their school is. Maybe it's an, uh, it's an as uh, aspect of who their coworkers are, or who they share needles with if they're an injection drug user, et cetera, or uh, who their Twitter followers are. You can represent these relational attributes between uh, people in a way that, you know, could not reasonably be uh, accommodated in most cases within a model like this. Um, and there's kind of ways you can twist up an aggregate model and, and try to capture some aspects of network um, characteristics, at least the number of people with whom a person is in contact. Um, but it gets pretty awkward pretty fast. And here within an individual-based model, an agent-based model as a, uh, by extension, you can keep track of that information. And as I had suggested in my example with samples early on, we have this characteristic of scalability. You, you may have recognized now um, that the characteristics of each of these people in the population, uh, while I asked you to put aside whether it's an agent when I showed this, um, these carry over very well to an agent-based representation, right? So for each agent in an agent-based model, we keep track of the characteristic. And if we need to keep track of an additional characteristic, like their, their current provident, province of residence, province or territory of residence, um, all we have to do is add an additional parameter, in, right? Have we doubled the size of the model by, keep, by adding that in? Have we multiplied it by 10 for keeping track of their province or 13 keeping track of their province or territory? No, we have not. We've just additively expanded the number of bits that a given agent needs to record. Maybe we've added a, you know, a, a four byte integer to what they have to tote around, right? What they, what they have to carry. But it's, it's not multiplying them by a factor of two if we add in whether they're an immigrant or not. No, we're, we're, we're just adding a single bit to what they require typically. Um, so, so, so that's a really um, advantageous uh, component of, of this sort of representation in, in agent-based models we don't get this combinatorial explosion. Agent-based models don't have to deal with this curse of dimensionality associated with aggregate stock and flow models because they're not trying to slice and dice the population according to the, um, to the, the characteristics and enumerate all possible combination of characteristics, right? Um, okay, so um, here, you know, we have these, oh, I didn't have to, I, I I'd forgotten, I had managed to achieve that in the closing frenetic moments before class uh, when I was experiencing the, uh, the technical issues with Google uh, Slides. So um, here, you know, each person, we can just layer in an extra, extra parameter. And, whoa, sorry. And the same thing holds with evolving characteristics. Um, so just as this holds for heterogeneity, sort of these static properties of individual agents, um, so it, it also holds for um, evolving characteristics. Um, and the news here is, is really quite good. Um, 
not only is it possible to specify in a kind of expressive, um, uh, uh, transparent style, different concerns that apply at the level of an of an agent. Uh, the fact that, for example, maybe we they have a process by which they change over time with respect to infection and a separate process by which they change over time with respect to care seeking, their attitude with respect to getting tested or, or getting securing treatment for their symptoms. Just as you could have different processes applying for that agent, we could represent them with different state charts. And uh, there's a certain very nice feel according to the software engineering principle of separation of concerns, a certain clarity of understanding that comes about by teasing these apart into two separate, in this case, two separate state charts. And often we, we pursue this with um, great, uh, to great advantage um, when we're building these models. And we, we, we uh, have this separation of concerns commitment that, uh, that allows us to systematically um, factor out, and that's a good word for it, the different um, dimensions, uh, the different processes by which a person might evolve. Um, so for example, uh, we might, when we're dealing with uh, substance use and, and issues having to do with um, overdose deaths and, and uh, disorder from from uh, things like uh, opioids and meth, we might have uh, some state charts which keep track of um, a person's status as a user or a current or former user. Uh, we might keep track of, uh, by contrast also though, the degree to which uh, they are um, you know, in a healthy state or in currently uh, an overdose, but, but surviving state. Um, we might, further maintain information, for example, about their status in the correction system. Um, uh, some, some people might uh, be incarcerated because of um, issues associated with, with drug use habits or, or other factors. And um, we might need to keep track of that for the scope of our model, which might include corrections and policing uh, concerns. We might uh, wanna keep track of their status with respect to the healthcare system, because some of the most vulnerable individuals when it comes to um, uh, having very severe illnesses and by extension, uh, having very severe um, uh, needs with respect to hospitalization, costs associated with them, uh, lengths of stays associated with them, uh, do include these individuals. And so we might keep track, for example, do they have a primary care physician and could that physician get them to addictions care to help, to help them break out of their, their habits, which, which have trapped their lives in a spiral of, of dysphoria and um, uh, adverse companionship and uh, risk of overdose. We might have issues related to their behaviors and, and management of pain. Many individuals might start using opioids because of chronic pain, for example, and get stuck in, that, uh, in the situation of physical dependence. So here we've parceled out into different areas different processes involving the same agent. By parceling them out, we're not saying they're independent. We're not saying that there's no dependencies, far from it. There are dependencies, but they're captured in artful ways. Instead of trying to keep track of every possible combination of states, you know, for, for every possible state with respect to the correction system, for that same state, keep track of every possible state with respect to the healthcare system, every possible state with respect to their readiness or change, every possible drug use state. That way, as Shakespeare wrote in King Lear, lies madness. Um, instead, we parcel these out into nice characterizations that are conceptually um, distinct and uh, deal with different aspects of the concerns. And then we artfully link them together using messages or by assigning to values of variables as you would have seen in that second video, if you watched uh, that uh, parts of it carefully, um, we can get one state chart to influence another. We can 
we can have these linkages, these coupling between state, uh, between processes that we all know are present without having a wholesale combinatorial explosion and running into the curse, the curse of dimensionality. Um, Okay, so uh, with respect to uh, evolution, we can have we can secure this value of, of separation of concerns, and that 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 helps us uh, attain a certain transparency of the model and a, and a conciseness, ladies and gentlemen, of model specification, an ability to to concisely um, specify the model without dealing with you know this overwhelming welter of different combinations. This uh, this just uh, inability to see the forest for the trees. Um, moreover, um, uh, it, it turns out that we can often secure some benefits associated with, with parallelism uh, as well. And we'll come back to that as possible in a, in a later lecture uh, of the course. Um, so you'll recall that aggregate system dynamics models ran flat into this issue with dimensions of state, if you had to have aging and you had to have you know, smoking status layered atop progression of diabetes, or if you had to have influenza laid atop COVID-19, you get this all possible combinations madness um, that, um, that, that ends up really getting the way of understanding model runtime, model evolution, model memory footprint, et cetera. Um, uh, but with both state and with aspects of heterogeneity, we escape the curse of dimensionality by going with agent-based models. Now that is a real advantage of this individual-based paradigm. And it harks back to you know, that, that same observation we had in these opening slides of what we get out of keeping track of each individual versus keeping track of summaries. But there's a lot more here that we secure than just memory savings, like we are dealing with here with bits and you know, bookkeeping on bits. We're, we're, we're securing something else. We're securing, in many cases, insight. Um, Hastings, perhaps it was, who said, uh, computer science, early computer scientist, who said, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. And it is in pursuit of that insight we, we pursue our, we, we uh, undertake our modeling. And, um, and this brings us closer to these insights. With aggregate system dynamics modeling, um, we have some unquestioned advantages. Um, if you're concerned about population size, about needing to simulate a full population of the world, you know, a, a very a, a key advantage that's afforded in the aggregate system dynamics sphere is its invariance to of running time and indeed space demand to population size. You can again double the size of the model. All you're doing is you're doubling the size of the numbers, or the sorry, you're double not double the size of the model. If you double the population size of concern, the, the catchment you're dealing with. You're doubling the size of the numbers uh, typically, and and you know the processors don't run any slower for those things, um, up to some some absurd limit, of course. Um, by contrast, with agent-based models, uh, doubling the population size will at least double with current naive implementations of these models. At least double the runtime of these models. Again, we'll leave defer for future discussion, the possibilities of, of uh, clever parallelization taking advantage of locality. Um, so the running time does run at least as fast as, as linearly. Um, and it can run, uh, oh, sorry, the running time rises. Uh, it, it, if you double the size, it at least doubles uh, the running time. Um, it rises with the population size, um, at least linearly. Um, with heterogeneity, um, you have this multiplicative effect. This is the curse of dimensionality. If you want to add in, you know, whether someone's an immigrant or not into the model, not only do you have to modify across the whole model, not only do you have to 
munge up the visual appearance of the model often, although you can minimize that with, uh, with subscripting. But you've got this multiplicative effect. You have twice as much state now to keep track of, twice as many differential equations to integrate, twice as much memory. But meanwhile, with agent-based models, you really have only very modest additive computational effort to add in. Yeah, I'll get someone to keep track whether or not they're an immigrant. One more bit, right? Um, if, if done uh, with uh, elegance. Um, uh, in addition, uh, system dynamics models don't allow you to capture continuous dimensions. Um, they don't allow you to capture, you know, the the income more precisely or the age more precisely. They force you to to divide it up into categories, um, which are often, particularly if you have quite a few dimensions of heterogeneity, um, and and you know, realistically, you typically max out at somewhere short of 10, um, uh, you, you end up uh, you know, increasing your, your total model size and total model runtime uh, accordingly to these, these uh, category number of elements in the category. So you typically make that smaller, like you have two possible income levels or three possible uh, income levels rather than you know, um, a, a, a double that represents someone's income, for example. But meanwhile, in agent-based models, hey, sure, uh, you want income as a continuous attribute, it's a double rather than a, you know, a bit uh, for, for two possible income levels. You know, no big, no big hit to performance, uh, no big hit to memory, uh, to memory footprint. Um, now, this should give you some sense of the differences in scaling between these two. And um, the scaling is, is one issue. The, the, the concerns about uh, transparency or another, um, this ability to factor things out neatly, to parcel things out into conceptually distinct spheres, while still taking into account their coupling through, through those artful connections. Um, uh, is, is very helpful for enhancing the transparency of the models to stakeholders. And whether it's aspect of uh, behavior with uh, wildlife, such as shown here, um, or whether it's in the sphere of, of uh, you know, concerns regarding um, substance use or, or infectious disease spread, uh, we secure a lot of advantages. But as we'll see, this story is only being partly told here. Um, there's many other advantages uh, for each of these that I'm not talking about. We, for example, we saw for aggregate system dynamics models, a, you know, a great power that can extend from the mathematical analysis of these models that really does not have an equal right now anywhere near it uh, within the sphere of individual based modeling. So when it comes to determining the stability of equilibria, or when it comes to determining the locations of equilibria for a wide variety of possible parameter values, you know, really the, the advantages are overwhelmingly in the aggregate space. For certain types of insights, the advantages are there. For other types of insights, the advantages are overwhelming at the individual based model. For example, within an individual based model, we can track each of these individuals over time. We can we can characterize the trajectories, as we say, of the evolution of a particular person as they evolve through successive states, as they evolve through dysphoria and break free of, of substance use habits um, and um, emerged uh, into population in, in, in a way that's, uh, that's uh, sustaining and with pro-social companionship. Um, we can track individuals over time. We can compare individuals' trajectories um, with what we see from real world data. We can secure insights by asking how a particular individual's eventual evolution depends on early interventions in that individual. We can look at aspects of their network context, of their family context, of their, of their context at, at workplace or, or in the school which um, 
which really is not feasible for a, uh, an aggregate system dynamics model. Um, so when it comes to these trade-offs, it's not one or another. Um, and we're going to see hybrid modeling, which is actually whispered um, uh, about right here. You'll see in this, this area of this uh, set of state charts are um, incongruously, perhaps to your eyes, met with a little stock and flow model. And indeed, system dynamics modeling is an admirably concise, transparent way of characterizing continuous processes over time. Processes where it's not that we make a distinction between continuous attributes, but rather the elements of state are themselves continuous. We can keep track of that in, a, in, a, in an agent-based model using a, a variable that's a double. But if we have dynamics defined over it, dynamics governed by certain equations, for example, we can often very fruitfully characterize it using system dynamics and we can layer that in to an agent-based model. And what you're seeing here is a weaving together of multiple lines of this model. So in today's environment, and particularly for any logic, um, it's no longer a matter of either or. It's not a matter of forsaking one to secure the other. It's a matter of weaving them together to the greatest effect. And just as with our software engineering, we weave together components written in different languages, JavaScript for the front end UI, um, Golang for elements of uh, server side state, um, uh, Haskell for uh, flexible uh, uh, language definition and domain specific languages, et cetera. We can weave together uh, different types of modeling. We secure the advantage of what we know in computer science as metalinguistic abstraction. We have the privilege of choosing the language with which we describe a problem, with which we approach a problem to greatest effect. Um, and uh, so it is within this sphere. And by so doing, we secure advantages when it comes to performance. We secure advantages when it comes to transparency. We secure advantages when it comes to matching up with empirical data with respect to representing key processes, like we'll explore next time over, over uh, networks and over space. But we also secure the, the advantage of being able to change what elements of the model we pursue in a single, um, with a single type of modeling over time compared, so we change the boundary between them. Maybe over time, we expand the system dynamics within an agent to include additional features. Um, and you'll notice this is one of the reasons why all throughout the past few lectures, when I refer to system dynamics models, I'm, I'm commonly, prefacing it with this or prefixing it with this aggregate characterization, because we can use system dynamics models to very good effect, for example, at the individual level within an agent. And just like we can actually use the mechanisms of agent-based modeling like state charts at the global level. And we'll see that soon enough, we'll be seeing discrete event simulation where we'll have agents flowing through discrete event simulation as entities, and we'll have discrete event simulation characterizing the essential dynamics associated with certain agents, such as clinics and uh, contact tracing processes for COVID-19 and other such spheres. So um, I hope I've given you a growing sense of some of the trade-offs and some of the differences between these methods not in the sense of viewing one as superior to the other, but in the sense of opening up your eyes as to what relative areas of strengths each offer. And that will be one of the big um, you know, take homes from the course. Uh, so when it comes to learning from this course, this course is unusual worldwide. Uh, it may be perhaps the only such modeling course out there, certainly one of the very few, which deals systematically with the three major traditions of modeling. And if you internalize an understanding of um, some of the major features of each tradition and their areas of strength, you can weave them together as a virtuoso who, who picks the right tools for the job. Um, 
forsakes the hammer when needing to saw through a piece of wood and puts aside the screwdriver when um, pounding the tacks uh, to, to, to um, uh, hold down a carpet. Okay, so uh, that's all we have time for today. Um, but I hope it lends uh, some understanding of the fundamental differences between stocks and flows and state charts, for example, but also ways in which the two mechanisms can complement each other. Next time we will go on um, to, to talk about um, context and networks, spatial environments, and the ways in which they uh, enormously enrich our, our ability to express the dynamics associated with processes within uh, agent-based modeling, individual-based modeling. Um, and uh, that will complete many of our uh, most important topics within the agent-based modeling sphere. Um, it's also a topic which is directly germane to, to this next problem set, which I'll soon be releasing. So thank you very much. I look forward to welcoming many of you at office hours in just a few minutes. Appreciate your attention. <laughs>